periodization. Strength and conditioning coaches and sport coaches use it to help their athletes progress and adapt to get stronger, faster, and more powerful. But what if the foundation of periodization has roots from somewhere else? What if periodization was never intended for sport at all? If I have tickled your curiosity, then you are going to love this podcast interview with John Kiley. John is a strength and conditioning coach and currently works at the Institute for Coaching and Performance at the University of Central Lancashire. His current research interests revolve around human performance and include the detrimental effects of fatigue on running coordination, the modernizing of periodization planning paradigms, stress as it relates to performance and health, genetics and sports performance, and the link between fitness, movement, cognition, and emotional health. I hope you enjoy this mind-blowing episode. Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast, a podcast focused on scientific and real-world expertise on training strategies between your ears, behind the oar handle, on the field and court, and in the strength and conditioning room. I'm your host, Joe DeLeo. I am a strength and conditioning coach, speaker, and lifelong student focused on continuous improvement. Thank you for joining me, and let's roll to today's episode. John, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Uh, nice to be here and talking to you. Likewise, I'm looking forward to this. How's uh, how's everything going in in Ireland? How's the weather? Uh, well, the weather in Ireland is always uh, always changeable. Uh, with always a forecast of rain, but uh, yeah, all's good. Good, good, good. Um, so I I think the the first thing uh, before we we get into you know. B- some of the work that you've done. Why don't you just take a, a few moments tell tell us a little bit about your background, um, some of the different you know uh, athletic sports you've worked with, um, and then also the work you're you're doing right now uh, in terms of your writing and teaching. Uh, okay, yeah. So I guess very quickly, I uh, I've been around the block a couple of times. Um, uh, as an athlete, I was. Uh, an international uh, boxer for a number of years, very mediocre, but you know it was a good experience and got to mix with some very very good fighters. Uh, mostly the wrong end, coming out the wrong end of it, but still, uh, I guess you can look back now and say <laughs> it was a good experience. Um, uh, yeah, and then from a, a professional point of view, uh, I guess I've been doing this a, a long time. Started out as you know. As a coach, uh, I was coaching maybe when I was 22 in, in combat sports, um, worked in a gym, went to university maybe around 26, 27, did a sports science degree there, worked within the Irish sports system, variety of sports, track and field, rowing, rugby, a few bits and bobs, was the head SNC for Paralympics, for the Irish Rowing Council, uh, couple of other bits and bobs. Went and did a Masters in Edinburgh, uh, maybe 2001. Uh, back to Ireland, did some more work. 2005, I worked the Paralympics in Athens 2004. Coached a medalist, my good friend Derek Malone, uh, PB to get a bronze medal at that Games. We were at the Paralympic World Championships, maybe 2005, and... Uh, I met some of the people from UK Athletics. They said there was a job coming up. Maybe I should apply. Applied for that. So got that job. So I was uh, head of SNC then for UK Athletics for the Beijing cycle. I stayed with them up until uh, close to 2012 or to the 2012 Games in London. I was obviously living in the UK at the time. I, I am Irish. A partner was back here, one of those situations. So... I now work for a UK university, but I do it from a small village in rural Ireland and just commute over and back when necessary. Uh, I guess uh, in terms of other sports, uh, so I've worked Paralympics, Olympics. I worked the Rugby World Cup in 2015 with the Irish squad. 
Uh, so I did three or four years with them. Six Nations would be the big rugby tournament of the year over here. Worked three of those. We won two of them. And then the 15 World Cup. Uh, 2013 worked with Laura Massaro, who was an excellent squash player. She won the uh, Ladies World title that year uh, and the British Open, which is one of the, the, the main events. Uh, 20, la, uh, 2018, I worked the Football World Cup with Egypt. Uh, so, again, good experience. So, obviously, experience doesn't equal expertise, and I'm not trying to sell myself as an expert in anything, but uh, yeah, but I have been around the block and worked with a fair few athletes in, in different sports. Yeah, so that's it in a nutshell. Fantastic, fantastic. So, variety of different sports, uh, been in the game a, a long time, a lot of, a lot yeah. of experience. Uh, and actually, I guess what I do now, so what I do now is I work, uh, we have a pathway called a professional doctorate in elite performance. And it we w- w- it is a doctorate for sports professionals. So it's not a conventional PhD, which is obviously very academically focused. It's more of a, for people with experience in sport uh, who want to challenge themselves to a significant personal development uh, trap uh, pathway and basically we are basically that's who I work with so it could be people with you know 10 20 years experience uh, I've a number of people in the states within you know uh, American football number of people over this side rugby soccer all kinds of sports uh, yeah so it, it's really interesting and it's all one and one work and uh I guess it allows me to, even though I'm not working frontline sports, uh, I'm working with people who are working frontline with with athletes all the time. Wow! So that that keeps 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 me uh, fresh, hopefully. Fantastic! Yeah. So you're that's a great opportunity to to learn uh, from them and and do some some coaching and mentorship as well. Sure. Very cool. Um, so. Before we, I get to specific questions about about periodization um, and and some of the the journals that you've published through through ResearchGate. The I guess the first question I have for you is what what sparked your interest uh, into writing about that subject matter? Uh, well, I, I okay. So f- for me, it's. Uh, it's not like a side issue. It's not a small issue. We tend to contextualize the training process around periodization. It's kind of the conceptual lens through which we think we should structure training. It's it's um, it's kind of shorthand for training planning mm-hmm. and. From that perspective, it seems like something important. Like we could argue all day about the ins and outs of sets and reps and intensities and volumes and proportions and distributions and eccentrics versus concentrics versus isometrics. But <laughs> periodization, periodization is one of these topics. Like it is uh, overarching, right? And I guess from my perspective, and for a long time, it's it's been about how can we service athletes better? How can we put everything together better? And from that perspective, periodization is a horrible topic because it's so big and it's so complicated and there's so many layers to it and there's so many so many bits we can't get at empirically. We'll never be able to empirically test or control in experiments. So it's a hard, unanswerable, murky, fuzzy topic. And that's what I meant by horrible. So all we can do is refine our philosophies um, and argue about them and debate them and kick them around and change our minds and just try and tack towards a an ever more insightful conceptual lens through which to view how we control athletes' training. Fantastic. Yeah, and that's that's one of the reasons I'm so glad that you and I had the opportunity to connect and sit down and talk about this Um because as I was reading some of your work, one of the things that came across to me, um, you know, and I was completely naive to it, is that 
a lot of the the roots and foundation of periodization uh, didn't have any ties to to athletics or sport originally. Um, and so that might be a really good starting point is just kind of talking about that historical uh, significance of where periodization was born from. Well, we were, at least the way I was educated. Um, sure. The way I was, ed- when I say educated, I was, a, I was a young coach that was just reading everything they could get their hands on. And, you know, nothing was worth anything unless it was done in the Soviet Union. That was pretty much the, the dogma. Uh, and we looked to the Soviet Union and we think, well, they periodized, so periodization must be the best way to go. So there was these very uh, generic assumptions. Uh, and a lot of it was just based on the Soviets were really successful, so they must be doing the right thing across the board, so we should adopt the same things and then we'll get success, which obviously is a pretty crappy way to to, to rationalise. Um, but, yeah, we, we can't separate periodization from the the time and the culture within which it evolved. So in the 30s, 40s, sport was becoming more more of a a kind of a global cultural um, influence. Nobody knew how to plan. Planning in in the 19th century had been basically, you know, go for X amount of walks, don't overdo it, eat steak four times a week. You know, those type of very rudimentary things. Uh, Come to 30s and 40s, people were starting to train more and didn't really know what to do. And and there was a couple of influences. First of all, there was, okay, so what happens in industry? How do we plan in industry? So there wasn't really a planning paradigm in industry. What had happened in uh, the 1910s, 1920s was that there was a Frederick Winslow Taylor is the is the guy whose ideas are most associated with this. He wrote a book called The Principles of Scientific Management, and basically what he did is some very rudimentary studies with time and motion is what he's most associated with. You know, uh, if we get the workers to do this, does it be, do, do things become more efficient? So he was, in a sense, the the set the original philosophy for. Uh, machine shop assembly line type logic first we do this then we do this then we do this so that was there as an industrial template then there was a socio-cultural uh phenomenon in terms of how, well how did planning happen at the time well at a governmental level certainly in the ussr it was five-year plans of you know lenin and stalin and and lenin certainly had read taylor's work and and greatly admired it now, I, I know I'm just flashing through this, but Taylor's work was really all about quantification, segregation, and alignment, putting things in a line. It was break things into manageable chunks, do the first job first, then the next manageable chunk, manageable chunk, do the second job, then the third job, you get a product out the end. He had a famous quote, which was, all we want of our, our workers is that they do what we ask. In other words, <laughs> the worker is is a drone. They're you know they're a robot. We program them. They do. Uh, now, okay. So Taylor was there. There's a Soviet five year plans. Then within the Soviet Union and Russia specifically, they they had a bad Olympics by their reckoning in I think 52 or 56 uh, now I think they came second or third but they or anything other than other domination was a failure so they got this young PhD student called uh, Leonid Matfiev to kind of crunch the numbers for them go back over training data from the 30s and 40s and figure out their best way uh, and Matfiev did that and the byproduct of that was uh, his little green book The Fundamentals of Sports Training wrote it in 78, published in the West in, in 80, 81, and extolled as the 
you know, Soviet secret, if you like. Um, and in the West, people went crazy for it. It was like, well, the Soviets have all the success. This is their secret. You know, how will we adapt it? And obviously things were taken out of context. Matt Fave wrote this not from a coaching perspective at all, but from a very much a kind of uh, pedagogical kind of uh, methodological uh, phenomenon or, or template. So it was really about how do we plan for mass participation rather than how do we get this athlete to the very top of their performance capacity? How do we squeeze as much as we can from that? And that's like a subtle distinction that is very rarely alluded to. It wasn't really set up for elites. It was set up for, on average, Joe Bloggs, you know, how do we get the most out of people uh, in general? <laughs> and so what he did was he crunched big numbers, and took very generalized lessons from them and pretty much just did some basic sums. If I divide, you know, if I have 12 months to get three months off, then we have three nines or three three month periods. What should we do? And it was all this very, very basic logic. A very basic logic that then had the science of the time backfilled underneath it. So and in a way, it can be kind of I want, comical is the word that's coming to my mind. But if you look at how people have in the past done, I guess, what you call scientific gymnastics to justify certain points. For example, the most popular uh, mesocycle, so training period duration, would be is four months, is four weeks. Uh, or his, historically it has been, but if you look at the major periodization theorists, they've all found different ways to justify it. So they've all put scientific language and a reference, but all used completely different ways to justify this four week thing. So I guess I'm using that as an example, just to highlight that in the West, in a sense, we looked to the USSR uh, because they were so successful and we felt there was all this really high quality science going on that we weren't privy to and that you know this method this book then provided it to us but really it was just the most basic generalizations the math mathematical formalization of the most basic generalizations that was presented as a scientific training paradigm when obviously it wasn't it was just if you have a huge number of athletes and you need to put some type of structure on this here's a type of structure you can put in it Interesting. so how does that sound <laughs> no that's that's good i mean that's that it's uh you know that's context that that as i said at the beginning i, I wasn't uh, aware of until I started reading some of your, your work. Um, and so I, I think when we kind of peel back the layers and we start looking at how, um, you know, Metia, for example, was writing that and, and the focus and intent that he had at the time and what it was designed to be used for w was something completely different. Um, and so kind of coming back to that, that also, can help to in some ways continue to move us forward because then we have a, we have a framework to work from, but we also can say, okay, that, that put a structure in place for us to begin, you know, training at some level and, and uh, with a lot of athletes. Um, but now, you know, we can continue to evolve from that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I guess maybe what I need to backfill is, there's been a couple of, of kind of inflection points or, or key landmarks in the in the theoretical journey since then. So, so Matfield's book became available in the West in, in the early 80s. Um, and a lot of people 
didn't read it first of all, but took secondhand information from it. And, you know, the other thing I'd add is it's a, it is not an easy read, hmm. and and I don't think that's Matthew's fault, but it it was written in Russian, it was translated to English. I think there's a lot of things lost in the translation. Uh, but the 1980s, early 1980s is quite a long time ago from a scientific perspective. You know, we're not driving the same cars or, you know, ingesting the same medicines or anything like that as we were then. Um, now, I guess the one major pivot point was people would have heard of Yuri Verkashansky, who was a, a very high profile coach in in the USSR in, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, high jump predominantly, but a, a very good theorist. Uh, and he he brought Matthew's teachings to task really and appropriately and just highlighted the fact that these are just ridiculously broad generalizations. Uh, and he encouraged people to, to think more about bringing individuals to uh, peak athletic performance by looking more at the physiological underpinnings of what actually happens. So where Matt, have looked at things from a kind of a broad organizational perspective, Verkashansky wanted to come in underneath that with, well, what happens when you do strength training? You know, how long rest do you need after a high intensity running session? The kind of nuts and bolts that we would think of as uh fundamental to a training program in other words if i do this now what's the consequence what's the knock-on consequence of that and how do i factor in all the things i have to do within the context of a microcycle uh famously 99 verkashansky came out with a um, an article in new studies in, in athletics which is the ioc journal uh, did, was it the death of periodization it was called but basically where he took matthew to task in a pretty brutal way um and that was a pivot point in, ter in terms of that was the, the beginning of the end for Matthew's fundamentals or, or his, that, the priority of that book as a, a theoretical foundation. So, and I guess they're the first two, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, the first two gurus, the first two experts associated with periodization. There's been a, there's been a few since then from a, from an academic perspective. There's really only been uh, one who's been published in a in a high profile journal, and that's uh, Vladimir Surin, who kind of came to, to attention maybe in the mid two thousands. So he promoted a method of training formerly known as block periodization. A method of periodization of, of, of training that was originally formulated by Bondarchuk, Anatoly Bondarchuk, uh, very famous hammer thrower and, and hammer coach. Bondarchuk formulated it, and it was really about uh, centered around focused blocks. So, what's our priority for this block? And minimizing the amount of blocks, whereas Matfield was about maintaining and increasing. Bond shot was about no, we're going to hit this hard and improve it. So, so when you say block, um, just for the audience when they're listening to this, yeah. the the coach who would be writing that program, they are emphasizing or picking a, a specific athletic quality to yeah. focus on for that block. Yeah. So it, you know, and it might be you know, it could be high intensity endurance, or it could be power, or it could be strength, but it is. A, Whereas the conventional Matfi of approach was more of a wave-like approach. So let's say volume is high, intensity is low, and then you have these bisecting waves, inversely proportional. So intensity, uh, intensity starts low, volume starts high. And then we work towards high intensity and low volume. Mm -hmm. If we take that as a basic Matfi of waveform, Bondarchuk was about focused intense blocks where from the the theoretical perspective all your adaptive energy goes into a minimal number of targets 
So you get a lot of improvement in a small number of targets. And depending on what flavor you adhere to, there may be some maintenance of other mm -hmm. uh, capacities or, or not. Uh, but that was basically block periodization concept. Uh, yeah, now I guess that's the one that most of the, like Matt Field's book obviously wasn't an academic book, although it's frequently presented as that. It was it was not a scientific book in any way, shape or form. Uh, Verkashansky wrote, but he wrote in coaching journals. He didn't write in kind of a peer reviewed academic literature. Uh, now, there have been peer reviewed periodization pieces, but I guess the only ones that have really been published in, in high quality journals were really when Nisurin came in and talked about block periodization. OK, so so there that's really, I guess, the 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 skinny on a very shortened evolution of periodization. Mm -hmm. From a scientific perspective, it is it is really easy to pull the rug out from under <laughs> out out from under it. I guess there's two things. One is that to put a training program or to put a philosophy justifying a training template in mind uh, uh, to just find a training template is a very hard thing to do because there are so many phenomena and concepts that apply to training that you can pretty much look through the science, spend a couple of days going through papers, and you can justify any crap you want to justify. No problem. And then it's really down to your ability to tell a story. And I'm, I'm not saying these people were purposely telling stories, but what they each had was a very personalized product. And, they, you know, certainly Verkachansky, certainly Yasurin, it was very, you could see that it was very much an ego thing. So Matfiev wrote his book, got a lot of press. Verkachansky comes in and slams Matfiev after Matfiev's dead. Verkachansky dies, Yasurin comes along and slams the two of them. And it's like, I don't know. I always think of it as, do you remember Monty Python and the Holy yeah. Grail? Yeah. yeah. I remember follow the shoe, no follow the gourd. <laughs> to me, that's it. That, you know, that's it. It's like follow my interpretation that I've backed up by this selective skimming of the literature and justification of this huge phenomenon, complex phenomenon by some isolated uh, academic references. And, and that's kind of been the history. Now, if I take it to now, yeah, so now I guess, and, and, and for the past number of years, it's been a, a periodization has been a concept in flux. Mm -hmm. There are people who are saying that is a bucket of shite, basically. Um, that is, you know, not academically justified, not sensible, not practical. And then there are others who are, no, the basic principles of periodization hold. We just need to modernize them a bit. And I think that's where we are culturally at the moment, at least from a theoretical perspective. It's, no, periodization is still valid. We just need to make all these changes and bend it a little bit and massage it here. And then there's others that was like, no, it, it's not fit for purpose. It needs to be changed. That's from the theoretical perspective. That's coaches talking about it and academics writing about it. I think what, what, what I've experienced, certainly from a point of underground elite athletics, elite rowing, rugby, football, whatever it is, what, what head coaches are coming in with is a set of ideas that they've kind of picked from a buffet of here's tradition in our sport. Here's a little bit of theory from the periodization literature that I happen to agree with. Here's a little bit of my own personal experience. And we're all kind of melding these together and shaping a philosophy. So you'd often talk to a, a very successful coach, ask them about the periodization and they say, well, I adhere to this method. But then you look at what's actually happening at the ground and oh, that's not actually that method. 
what you've created is your own method that you think is that method or or you talk to someone who say no but i don't agree with that method i agree with this method but then you find that what they actually do on the ground is the same as what this guy who's flying a different flag is the same as what they do so i think at the moment there's a lot of there's a lack of clarity and it's not a bit surprising because it is such a a complicated, complex topic where there can't possibly be one best way. There can't possibly be this is the right way to periodize. But I think what there can be is this is a better approach. Sure. Uh, and sure. I think that's and I think that's where where we need to go. I think the periodization is dead. Periodiza- periodization is still alive and kicking. It just needs a little bit of a, a transplant. I don't think that they're resolvable or even important arguments. I think it's, for me at least, it's more about how do I set coaching processes and planning processes in place that enable uh, a plan that is unique to this environment and this set of athletes and this competition schedule in this environment and how we can set constraints so that the optimal planning process can can emerge, can can percolate to the top. Yeah, and that, and that's exactly what you said at the beginning too. And coming back to that point is how can we help bring the best out of the athlete um, in terms of the the physical attributes that we're trying trying to uh, help them achieve, and be able to do it at a certain point in time because that's part of the one of the variables when it comes to sport um you know some sports they're working towards you know over a quadrennium towards the olympics some may have a higher frequency of games uh, like rugby or, or soccer um where they're playing you know on a much more frequent basis um so those are those are all excellent points and hopefully that it gets everybody's wheels turning and thinking about this a little bit more um critically and stepping back and seeing what, what we can do to put the athlete in a better position uh, to continue to adapt and, and progress. And then the, the only other thing I'd say to, that I think is important to tie into this, um, and you did a wonderful job of kind of uh, providing a really good overview of, of periodization there, is touching on uh, Hans Selyer and um, – uh, his work with general adaptation syndrome. And um, while that's not directly tied to periodization, it does kind of factor in there in terms of how the athlete's adapting. And it's something that um, has been sort of over the years just become a staple, so to speak. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing me back to that. I, I meant to mention that because I think it is actually important. Um and in the past, and still, if somebody criticized periodization, the argument on the other side defending it tends to go back to in 1930, Hans Selye said, as if that's the last word in the in the debate. But anyway, I think it is an important point. So And I should have brought it in. So there was, as I said at the start, there was cultural influences, there was industrial influences, there was kind of ideological, you know, this is how you should plan, this is how our country will plan or our culture will plan. But there was also a science at the time that seemed to support that perspective, or at least could be bent out of shape enough to use it as a justification to support the type of uh, rigid planning process that was uh, interpreted from Selye's, from Matthew's work. So essentially, the Selye story, and I'll try and keep it short and sweet, uh, medical doctor, Vienna, moves to Canada. Uh, I think one, it's around the time when cortisol was discovered. So he ends up investigating this. I know investigating is is a loose word. They didn't really have any good way of measuring hormones or neurotransmitters, obviously, at the time. 
So what he used to do is basically his job was to be nasty to rats. So, you know, you, you put rats in extreme cold. You put them on the roof of the university building in the Canadian winter. You put them in the furnace building so they're too hot. Basically, you do what we would call stress the rats. Okay, so you get them running continuously, blah, blah, blah. And then he would sacrifice the rats, cut out their adrenals and weigh, crush them up and weigh them. That was, that was the measuring stick. This was not refined science. Um, so, so that's what he did and basically found that, I guess in, in, in simple terms, that if you significantly stress a rat, there is uh, there there are a number of consequences, and yeah, as you can imagine. Uh, <clears throat> now, the consequences that, that that he he noted were okay. So there's there's change in the mass of of, of certain glands. Okay, they, they atrophy or they hypertrophy. Um, and then he had this kind of conceptual thought that if you stress, if you overstress, there's an, there's an overshoot and you will get sick and you won't adapt. If you stress just enough, then there'll be a little bit of a detriment, but it'll be short term and then you'll overshoot and you will supercompensate. Okay, now that sounds like the type of language we're talking, right? Okay, we train, we fatigue, and um, and and someone improves as a result. And around that time, like this is coming into the fifties, there's a couple of very smart coaches, uh, Forbes Carlisle, swim coach from Australia, uh, Doc Councilman in the States, another great swim coach. They started picking up on ideas because it made absolute intuitive sense to them because that's what they saw. We train too hard, the wheels start to come off. We don't train enough, we don't move forward. And and in some way, the Celia's work got transported into our world and then held up a scientific justification that 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 this was like a firm law. If you do too much, there's breakdown. If you don't do enough, there's no adaptation. It's got to be baby bear's porridge. And we all agree that that is common sense and that is logical. But I think where we went then went a bit too far is people put time frames on this based on nothing. And then those time frames became immutable laws that were unquestioned. Celia's work, it's like, mentioned in pretty much every published periodization piece in 1935, Celia said. And that's then, it's like a sleight of hand. It's like a magician distracting you. It's like, oh yeah, there's a reference, so this must be true. And then there's this, it's held up as justification for this huge set of complicated rules and guidelines that this said nothing about. Celia himself, just before he died, uh, was given a presentation in Australia. And I think it was Forbes Carlyle asked him, did you ever think of the impact that your work would have in sport? And he said, I never thought about this in terms of sport. He never wrote anything about sport. He wrote about, originally he wrote about what happens if you, if you do mean things to rats. That's what he thought about. His work was innovative, creative, hugely beneficial at the time. But stress as a concept, as he evolved it, is not what we know about stress now. Now we have completely different ways. Sorry, I won't say completely. The basics still apply. If you get too much stress, it's a bad thing. If you have too little stress, it's a bad thing because you don't grow, you don't develop. Uh, but, but we do know that we can't put rules and templates and time frames and magnitudes, you know, we can't put that, we can't overlay that on this very vague theory 
and justify a specific planning template. Yes. Uh, two, two other things I want to add in there that um, from reading your work, I think are, are just important to, to interject into our conversation. So one was um, when I read uh, your paper, uh, Cellier also said that he only thought about, thought about stress uh, purely in a, in a physical um, uh, adaptation or, or it only affected uh, the the rat or the individual from a physical standpoint. He never took into context stress having an effect uh, socially, mentally, emotionally, and in other uh, areas. Um, so that so that I thought was pretty important to mention. And then the second one, the, the the big one that you hit the nail on the head there was people come back to general adaptation syndrome, and somehow when we start to look at periodization, it's okay. Um, we have a mesocycle, it's four weeks, the athlete's going to be able to adapt in that four week time. And we're going to be able to get the athletic attribute or quality that we're, we're looking for. There's going to be a, a positive change and some may adapt in that time period. Some may do it shorter. Some may take longer. Um, but that's where we start getting into that, that individualization, uh, standpoint. Well, you, I mean, you're raising a very interesting point there. So periodization is all set up uh, and all the major forms of periodization are we will do this for this amount of time. At, all based on the assumption that at the end of that training period or training block, you will have achieved like you will have achieved the right amount of strength, let's say. And so it's a strength training phase you will have achieved the right amount of strength in four weeks. And then we don't need to worry about it anymore. Then we'll do power or endurance or whatever it is. But obviously that is the most bizarrely, <laughs> like you can't justify that. You do not know how somebody will respond to any form of training. The only thing you do know about response is if you have a group, they will all respond differently. And they will respond differently dramatically. So, again, I guess, and we're kind of coming back around to Matt Fiff. What we had were him doing a lot of solid work on the information he had available through the lens of his time, culturally, politically, scientifically, and making these at the time phase valid general conclusions. But we can't now keep using that justification to 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 uh to to plan the programming of high level athletes or not high level athletes forget high level any athlete who wants to uh increase the efficiency and effectiveness of their training program absolutely that concludes part one of my interview with john kiley here is part two john welcome back to the show Hey, Leo, glad to be here again. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. So as we wrapped up part one, you did a beautiful job of discussing and talking about the historical uh, roots of periodization and also uh, stress theory from Hans Selye. And then as we wrapped up there, uh, one thing that we wanted to make sure we tackled right away at the beginning of, of part two here is the zombie idea. And so I'm going to, I'm going to kick it over to you, but what is the zombie idea and, and why is this something as coaches and perhaps athletes we should be aware of? Uh, well, so the, I, I first came across the term, uh, Paul Krugman, he's a Nobel prize winner, economics, 2008 and a, a New York times uh, opinion piece writer for the past 20 years. So, you know, one of these giant brains that marauds around the planet. Uh, now, I don't think it was his original phrase, but but he certainly wrote a book that used it. And what he talked about was zombie ideas. And a zombie idea is an idea that should be dead, but isn't dead. It's an <laughs> idea that that lurches along, you know, that that clings to the dark corners of our brain and then lurches along um, doing damage, but we don't really notice them. We don't know that they're dead. They're, you know, they're, 
I'm actually I'm dragging I'm dragging the ass out of the metaphor here, <laughs> um, but but you, you get the point. A zombie idea is an idea that should be dead, but we haven't put it we haven't buried it yet, and it's 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 lurching around inside our brains. And it, some examples would be a lot of our conventional training theory was formulated at the time, you know, it was by people who were just as intelligent as us, just as experienced coaches as us, but they didn't have the same background of information and wealth of information that we have now by a long shot. And their ideas, while they made sense against the context and the cultures of the time, don't make sense now. We, we talked about, you know, for example, Frederick Winslow Taylor and his ideas around how to manage work, work life, and again, you know, they worked in a very limited context, but you broaden out that context and, and they just don't work at all. They're damaging. That's a zombie idea. That's an, that's something that should be dead. That, And it is dead in, in from an industrial planning perspective. We know that it's not sin, simple linear planning. It's it's complex. Uh, and in in training, we're kind of stuck in a halfway house. We've evolved along some paths, but not along all paths. And I think there's plenty of training zombie ideas out there. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in terms of periodization, a lot of the arguments, at least in the literature, have been about this is, you know, what's the best model? And it's, you know, this is the best model, follow my model. Uh, and it's predominantly been a battle among old dead Soviets, you know. Right. Right. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that because some of them aren't dead, actually. Um, so, and and we've kind of watched from afar and thought that, that these are the people we should be listening to this and we've adopted a lot of their ideas without knowing the, the background, the logical, rational scientific background under them, or even if there is any, and in most cases there isn't any. Uh, don't want to go back over the history of it too much, but uh, a lot of it is based on good, clever coaches making an assessment with limited information and then us perpetuating those assessments and the models that, they, that those assessments led to. Okay, so so what's an example of a zombie idea? Well, one example is the fact that we have this general perspective that there is a universal best way to train for whatever the given sport is or whatever the given level of athlete. We have this zombie idea that by and large, although there's going to be some degree of inter-individual variation, people respond generally the same way to a given stimulus. And the available science for the past 10, 15 years clearly illustrates that that's not the case. We respond dramatically differently. Now, there hasn't really been a lot of work done in this in elite athletes, but if you take just your, you know, age matched normal people and look at their responses to very simple uh, training interventions, be they endurance or strength training, their responses range dramatically right across the spectrum from you might have a simple strength training exercise like a, a bicep curl, for example, and measure a small muscle like an elbow flexor. And some people, their size will decrease. Others will increase dramatically. So it's this really broad bell curve and that's using a very very simple exercise intervention and a very very simple measure when you scale that complexity up to you know you're an elite international level rower or something like that and if i'm the coach and i'm giving a crew of eight the same training program and expecting them it, that program to do the same thing to all of them from a scientific perspective, that is a ridiculous perspective at this stage, and we have to just acknowledge that. Uh, for some people, it will be potentially detri detrimental or, at, at the very worst, a waste of energy. For some people, it might be spot on, but I think the days of just universally rolling out 
one program for the masses or one planning template for the for the masses, it's obviously not ideal by a long shot. Now, at the same time, we need to recognize the practical constraints. Uh, you're a part-time coach, you're working with part-time athletes, you only have X number of contacts, X amount of time to give to the project. You can't be devoid, you can't be, you don't have access to a lot of technology, a lot of testing device. Uh, you can't totally individualize a program for everyone because it's just not, not logistically feasible. But I guess the challenge that I'd lay down is we know that if I can get any bit of more individualization into someone's program, it's likely to be of positive benefit. But from an injury risk perspective, a personal buy-in perspective, and a physiological adaptation perspective. So how can we infiltrate degrees of choice and degrees of freedom and degrees of athlete input? And how can we integrate that into a program that works within our logistical and time constraints and that also gives the athlete that sense that, you know what, the coach respected my opinion, the coach has taken steps to develop a program that better suits me, the, the coach has taken steps to ensure that I'm happy with the program, and all those type of things, they're worthwhile. They are, I would think, fundamental, not just fundamental dimensions of being a good coach, but if you want someone to respond physiologically to training, then all of those things for me are fundamental. Just to the extent that the athlete believes in the program, buys into the program, believes in you, trusts you, believe that you uh, are considerate of their perspective, all those things are gold. Uh, all those things are critical. If you don't have those, it doesn't matter how nice the Excel sheet that you plan is on. It doesn't matter how mathematically symmetrical your increases and decreases in, in training volumes and intensity or your waveforms are their fun, fund, the fundamental foundations that support physiological training adaptation. So I think we're bringing it back to the periodization uh, topic. There's lots of zombies left around periodization. The idea that there's a best training model, of course there isn't. There's a best model for you for now within your current context. That's all. And it's not Matfield or Verkashansky or Bamba or Surin. It's what you and your coach can work out to fit your context, your needs uh, against the the demands of the of the season or the cycle or whatever the the, the training framework is yeah so how's that that was beautiful that was great <laughs> uh, i so um to give this even more context um and i think this is a in terms of the time that we're doing this this is a really valuable interview that we're doing right now given given the current situation with the covid19 pandemic and everything so Let's just say, by and large, most coaches are not going to be in a situation where they have a high tech environment where they could be, you know, doing, um, you know, velocity based training or or something that's going to allow them to utilize technology to really dial it in. So let's think about if we're working with the, you know, the junior, the high school developmental athlete or a, a university athlete uh, in sports that you know, may not have the budget or the revenue that some of the, you know, more revenue generating sports do like American football or basketball or soccer or rugby, um, like rowing, for example, uh, or lacrosse, um, you know, or swimming. What are some things that the, the coaches and the athletes could do on a day-to-day -day basis that would give them a good snapshot of that athlete's nervous system? And, you know, are they ready to be able to train at a, at a higher intensity or do we need to take it maybe a little bit easier today because they're, they're overstressed, they're, they're overstressed. 
Okay, so there's a lot in that question. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm up to that, this particular task. So if I forget anything, just just rein sure. me in. Sure. I guess I guess the first thing I'd say that um, technology is a it's a blessing and a curse. It's a it's a double edged sword, and I think a lot of the well resourced sports have got themselves into an awful muddle. Um, because they have assumed that a fancy piece of kit that gives you a number is right. But there isn't really... Yeah, let me see. What's the best way to put this? You, you, you can't take a measurement, one single measurement, it could be velocity, it could be load lifted, speed, whatever it might be, and make a link between that and the amount of stress it pushed it put on the athlete. That's the first, like, and it's the, a fatal blow in a sense. So that doesn't mean that, for example, if if I'm Man United and I'm using GPS as all the top football teams are, GPS isn't a problem unless you overinterpret GPS. And you assume that, you know, that the number of high speed meters you do is actually an accurate reflection of the amount of stress placed on the individual. So the amount of stress placed on an individual is always a combination of a couple of things. It is the the, the physical load, the, the mechanical load. Absolutely. That's a main driver. But it's also the backdrop you overlay that on. So what I mean is, let's do a thought experiment. So it's it's Leo wakes up, has his breakfast, goes to the training ground. We get him. We take some of his DNA and there and then we replicate. So we have an identical twin, Leo Mark II. So you have the exact same everything. But one of you, we put some negative thoughts in your mind. Shit, you know, this is going to be a hard training session. Uh, and is that knee still sore? Is it? Oh, yeah, you better be careful with that. Subtle little things like that. The other Leo, we're the opposite. We might, may say the same things like, you you know, you know, you need to be careful, but don't worry about it. You just frame things differently. So you have, you have a, a version of you that's, positively orientated or not maybe positive isn't the right word because this isn't just about positive thinking but is is not yeah I, yeah let's call it positively framed this person is slightly negatively framed then maybe we overload stress on one person uh just before they go out to train we tell them that you know what your contract is up for review so we may be taking that three hundred thousand a week off you whatever it is I'm struggling with the examples, but the thing is, maybe you stress someone, maybe you put some negative beliefs in someone's head. You don't do the, the same to, to Leo Mark one. You send them into train. They could have the exact same stats, go through the exact same training load. Will the training adaptation or injury risk or time taken to recover, will that be the same for both of them? No, it won't. It'll be completely different. Now, and there's another zombie idea, the idea that you can control someone's training progression purely by controlling the mechanical load over time. And that's quite a big one. And that's one that's pervasive in our cultures and has been from the very start. And it originated at a time when, you know, mind, brain and body were completely separate entities. And training was it's. You know, it was the mechanical, uh, the, the mechanical loading of physical structures to give you a predictable outcome. But there is no predictable outcome. And the outcomes will vary dependent on what the athlete feels about the training they are doing. If you are not confident about in the training you're doing, if you don't see a direct link between the training you are doing now and your future goals and where you want to be and how you want to get there, that training is going to be suboptimal to you. Uh, if you 
have doubt about the training. I mean, that's a big, big problem. If you think, oh, no, this training always flares up my knee, that's a big problem. If you think, you know what, I don't really know why we're doing this, then that's a big problem. And again, it doesn't matter what your Excel sheet looks like. That's poor coaching. That's poor planning. So I think training, planning, because I guess that's what we're talking about, it's as much about how you present the plan to the athlete, how you educate the plan, how, sorry, how, do you, how you educate the athlete in relation to the plan, how you can explain to the athlete that this plan is your best effort at coming up with a set of future trainings that are most likely to give them optimal adaptation. But what the way we have looked at training plans is something that the coach does in a darkened room on their own and then dictates to the athletes and, you know, just do it. Yeah, but just do it won't cut it. If you want those athletes to adapt positively, there has to be more. There has to be a degree of education. There has to be a degree of getting them on board. I would suggest there's a, a degree of uh, self-determination that the athlete has. In other words, you give them a forum, be it in a monthly meeting or, you know, whatever your constraints allow, that a, a forum where the athlete can say, you know what, I'm really, I, I don't know why we're doing that. And that gives you the opportunity to listen to that and revise it or to, to have the conversation and convince them. But regardless of what the coach thinks, having a group of athletes doing any type of training they don't believe in is not good practice, regardless of what it might say in the theory or books or, you know, presentations or whatever, or culture. If the athlete doesn't believe in a very, very real way, not in a fluffy, nice to do, give everyone a cuddle way, but in a very real way, they are not going to biologically adapt optimally to that training session. And again, the very basic mechanism is uh, I have mechanical load, but that mechanical load is overlaid on a background neurobiological environment. That neurobiological environment is set up by the, the, the chemistry of your internal system. That is in large part regulated by what you feel at the moment, what you expect at the moment, what your how this training emotionally resonates with you. That's going to dictate the neurochemical environment, the electrophysical physiological environment, the hormonal environment. And there are things you need in your favor if you're expecting someone to adapt. OK, so. Yeah, the, so, so that was a, a little bit of a rant there. Uh, you also mentioned um, totally tra changing track, uh, the nervous system, and how could we get a handle on, on that, especially without tech. So uh, what, what I mean by that and what pick me up if I'm wrong here, but how do we know now is a good time to push hard or now is a good time to have our quality, hardcore, you know, um, Balls, balls to the wall type session. Uh, even if you had access to the best tech in the world, that's a difficult target to hit. That's a difficult question to answer. I think there are some types of tech that can give you a bit of insight, maybe. But I think my first port of call would always be an athlete and coach pair that are well tuned in to one another. So the athlete knows exactly what you're talking about when you use the terms that you use to describe readiness to train. What is your readiness state? So you have a shared language. And you'd be surprised how much coaches and athletes don't have a shared language. Coaches will have words they use all the time, but you go to the athlete and ask them what do those words mean? And it is not clear at all that they have the same meaning as the coaches. There isn't really any evidence or science on this, but I know in like doctor's visits, 50% of patients, this is in the, in the US-based study, 50% of patients 
didn't under, didn't correctly understand what the doctor was saying to them. Now, you wouldn't expect the same kind of hit rate between coaches and athletes because you'd like to think they'd spend more, more time together. But I would just suggest that as humans, there's going to be a lot of breakdowns in communication if you assume that what you're saying is clear. So I would think there's a need for, as a coach, to constantly track back, constantly check that does the athlete, are, are myself and the athlete on the same wavelength? Do we have the same understanding of, the, of this concept? And it's pretty important that you do. Because if you do, and, and this is get, getting back to the, are they ready to go? It's only if you can have that, the same idea in your head of what ready to go means or what readiness to train means. You need to have the same definition in your head. You need to have the same language and terminology around that. And you need to have a shared mental model of what that looks like for this athlete. And I think if you have that, then what you can do is through dialogue, you can start to calibrate. So the athlete is the the athlete is the measure. They can dial into how they feel more accurately. They can communicate it to you more accurately. You were more calibrated with them then to make a judgment, to make a training decision. And I don't think this is like onerous work. This is just careful work. It's not assuming they understand what you're talking about. It's making sure they understand. For me, it would also mean maybe within the plan, there may be a you know an hour every whatever it's appropriate, you know, based on scale and so on. An hour every three weeks, an hour every month where it's me and you and we're going to talk about, we're going to review what happened, what worked, what didn't, what didn't, you know, what you didn't like, what you did like, what we're going to do moving forward. All of those things, they're not just diplomatic relationship nice to do's. For me, they're essentials in, t- in terms of one, convincing the athlete they're in the right path. Two, you getting valuable feedback from the athlete to, that enables you to change things that may not be working or they may not perceive as as, as working. Um, and yeah, so in terms of determining readiness to train, you get that calibrated language and you're in a better place than you are if you're getting one number that reflects one metric that reflects this much broader phenomenon which is readiness to train. Because readiness to train, it's not a physical phenomenon. It's not purely an emotional phenomenon. It's a mixture of the two. It's a blend. There's there's one other thing I'd say on that, and and this is slightly going down a cul-de-sac, but there is a time, obviously, for self-regulation. But there's also a time for not self-regulation. You're feeling crap, that's a pity, but we're going hard because you got to, you're a competitor. You know, you can't wake up on, on race day and say, well, you know, I'm not really feeling it today. Your challenge is, we're going to go hard, we're going to go hard in 40 minutes. You do. You go through your routine to get yourself in the right place. The same as you do on competition day if you feel crap. And dropping those type of pressure tests in on them. So it's, and I guess good coaching for me, it's 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 a blend of the touchy-feely, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but, you know, a, a little more uh, empathetic, communicative, or communicative, good, good communication, uh, good dialogue, but then there's also, you're not feeling good today, but we're going hard today. So you need to go through your routine to get yourself in the right place. And then we go hard. There is a, and you see it in, you see it a lot in professional football, uh, soccer. Um, You don't see it in a sport like rugby at all. People feeling sorry for themselves. People being overly sensitized to, oh, my hamstring is a little bit tired, so I cannot do anything today. Uh, and in a sense, the individual cultures have created kind of professional athletes that are full of fear, that are sensitive to any type of 
negative messaging. And this is one of the big problems with tech, like, for example, um, a lot of the sleep apps, for example, are, are, are a good illustration of this. A lot of endurance athletes will be very tight on monitoring their sleep, monitoring their training volumes. If things go a little bit wrong, oh my God, I only slept for X number of hours last night, that's a problem. No, it's not a problem. You're not like a China doll. You're a professional athlete. You can't have these things causing anxiety. Anxiety will screw with, first of all, your neurochemistry, which will then screw with your biochemistry, which will then screw with everything else from your perception of effort to your coordination. So if we pay too much credence to all the messages that the monitoring tools are giving us, and there's a very real danger of that at the moment, then what you're doing is you're setting up an athlete to be sensitive, to be overly sensitive. And there's, there's a difference between having information that informs you about risk so you can make an informed decision. So that's at one end, that's what you want. But on the other end, what you have is over, anxi over anxiety, over sensitivity. And all of a sudden you've created, when, where you want a robust, tough competitor, you get someone that is full of worry and anxiety, and that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you go out to compete and you're anxious, you're more likely to underperform, you're more likely to get injured, and there's a vicious circle there. And I guess what you what we do know from where when it's been studied, anxious athletes, and some of us are more anxious by by trait, you know, we're in, innately more anxious but we'll be more inclined to injure. We'll be more inclined for overuse syndromes, burnout, et cetera, et cetera, and deselection from the sport and, and, and dropout. From a coach's perspective, we need to be aware of that because if we see it in athletes, we need to help them. If we get a group of whatever number, they'll all be different. Some will handle criticism differently. Some will handle dip, dips with form or defeat differently. So how we get everyone across a team to be robust, first of all, it requires awareness that they're all going to respond to different things. And then as much as is feasible within the logistical constraints, it's for the coach to, okay, I need to, and it could be, for example, a change in self-talk during warm-up for the anxious athlete or giving them some activities that they do outside of training that uh, enables them to regenerate a little more or relax a little more. Standard things I've done with athletes, athletes before are, you know, for those who like to do a bit of meditation, do some mindfulness, do some breathing. I don't believe that it's going to be good for everyone. It's what suits people. A walk in nature is an excellent one. Uh, Self-reflective writing is an excellent one. But again, it's the same as training. You're looking for what are the what's the collection of ideas that this athlete can try so we can work towards the right set of tools for them to use. And this is especially important if people are coming. A lot of travel and uh, important tournaments, this is where this will really come out. And it's important to have those strategies in place. And if I have to return to the team with zombie ideas, that's a big zombie idea in periodization. It's all about the training. It's all about how we do damage. It's not about how we rebuild. That wraps up part two. Now on to the final part of my interview with John Kiley. That was, that was a great job of going over a lot of the things in the background that take place uh, in, in regards to training. And we're not, again, just looking at the, the physiological stress that's going on to the, the, the athlete. We're talking about um, the language, the communication. Um, we're talking about how they deal with 
uh, their own interpersonal stress or anxiety around the training session, um, or if they're, you know, maybe have some lingering soreness or, or injury that they may or may not be dealing with, how that plays a factor into how they may, may adapt. So I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. And let's say we're dealing with a high school or a junior athlete, somebody that's not quite as mature as the athlete that I had in mind when you were describing everything. They haven't been training, you know, for eight to 10 years. They're not as in tune with their body awareness. Um, they don't understand all those things. And so, you know, they, they show up to, to do a training session with you or me and, you know, they, they get there and, you know, their, their hamstrings a little sore, uh, and, and they're pretty hesitant about pushing hard. Right. Um, how do we take that athlete who's maybe 15, 16 years old and educate them about how to still properly train, how to still get a quality session in, those types of things? Because they don't know yet. So there's a big education component there. Yeah, look, that's, that's a great question. Um, and what I would say is, I think what the way we need to look at it, like say we, we, we're working with a 15-year-old new to the sport athlete. We we can't have big, long convers- philosophical conversations before they do any type of you know session and or every session. But what we can do is gradually release out little bits of education, develop a relationship, develop dialogue. Uh, so... To, to, to make this a little clearer, you come in as a 15-year-old athlete. I'm not asking your opinion of what we should do or how things felt or anything like that. I might give certain criteria, like maybe three guidelines. If anything is sore, come and talk to me at the start. Now, this is, let's say we're, we're doing a group session. So I pull the group aside at the start. Uh, here's the objectives of, of our session. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what you should feel. Uh, Then any questions. If any of you are sore or are worried about anything, come and say it to me now. If any of you aren't clear of the objectives of the session or how hard or easy it should feel, uh, come and say it to me now. Uh, and just present a little bit more like that, where there's a little bit of here, here's, and, and this is obviously subtext. Here's why this session will be good for you. Here's what the session is going to, here's what we're going to do in the session. Here's what the session should feel like. But also, but I care about one if something feels bad and there's a, an injury risk, because we need to mitigate that. So you need to come and talk to me. And I do also care about how you feel about this session. I'm trying to convince you this is good. Now, and then that p- person is in the program a year. That kind of pre-training uh, communication hit changes. It morphs over time. And it, it you may be farm out a little bit more decision making so for example in this second exercise you have a choice so do whichever you feel will work best for you or uh, you can do five reps or seven reps of this interval we only want your rpe to go to eight eight point five out of ten you need to cap it there as soon as you hit that that's no problem you can knock off things like that where you're just You're not just saying, this is the training session, go do it. You're always kind of playing around the edges, providing little bits of education, providing little bits of athlete leeway and decision making. So so that's how how I would do with that. And what you're doing is you're, you're playing a very slow game of you're adding on small little bits of education, uh, within, say, the context of there's going to be a really quick uh, brief of what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. Then there's going to be a really quick debrief at the end 
okay, guys, that that, that was okay, you know, or, or that was good or that was bad for these reasons. Here's what we're going to do the next day. Here's what you need to do before you get into the session to make sure you're on point to get the most out of the session. Off you go. That type of stuff. So it doesn't interfere. It's not asking the coach to add an extra hour on. It's two or three minutes at the start, a minute at the end, but it's consistency. It's every group session. And then over time, you can make things a little bit more. Uh, you can add in degrees of freedom. You could add in layers of decision making that you could, that the athlete can take either on their own or in conjunction with you. But the objective is that 15 year old, by the time they're 25 and they're elite, they can engage in meaningful, informed discussions with the coach using a shared language, a shared mental model of where they need to be and what they need to do to get there, that they have a relationship that the coach has morphed from a kind of a, a, a teacher, you know, to a, a mentor sounding board. And that's where we want to be, I think. Uh, ultimately, that's where you want to be. I mean, it doesn't mean that you turn into this um, super cuddly friend. It means you're the you are the person that's on their side, giving them the hard news as well as the good news and giving them the critical uh, the critical comment as well as the positive comment. But there's trust uh, and there's engagement there. And the, and and there's that, I you know, when, he, when the coach says this word, I know what she's thinking about. And when I use this word, she knows exactly what I mean. So there's minimal room for error because I don't think we realize as coaches how much, how much of what we say falls on deaf ears or is misunderstood. And it's really important that we clear that up. Uh, and getting back to you know what we talked about in terms of assessing when an athlete is good to go, when they're not good to go, I think a lot of that can be sorted out through ongoing dialogue and le- you learning the athlete and the athlete learning you and just and trust and open communication from that perspective. That was that was great, John. Yeah, so uh, I really um, I really appreciate you know, some of the, the tenants and the concepts you touched on there in terms of taking an athlete that might be around 15 years old to the time when they're 25 and it's, it's establishing and taking the time to make sure that they have a clear understanding of, you know, what words mean and the intent behind those words. So that way when you're using consistent, verbiage consistent language on a you know weekly or daily basis that has a lot of meaning to that athlete and they know exactly how they need to be executing right um and so it's it's like you said just taking a couple minutes you know at the beginning to to explain um what the focus is, what the intent is for the training session these are some of the things you should be feeling that type of thing and then and then circling back at the end and getting that feedback from them of, you know, what worked well, what didn't work well. Um, but, but I do find it interesting. So, so you actually, you wouldn't try to take any type of, um, uh, like physical measurement. Like, so for example, you wouldn't do anything like looking at a uh, reactive strength index by having them do like a vertical jump or, you know, a hand dy- dynamometer looking at grip strength to see how they're, how their their nervous system is on the day uh it would depend on the context okay um just curious. yeah and no no i mean don't get me wrong I'm, I'm not anti that at all and i do use it in practice but there is no right answer there is yeah there is no one metric that works for everyone i think what i would do if i was bedding in to work with an athlete for a prolonged period is try a few things. What you'll often find is that someone is sensitive to some things, but not to others. Oh, you know, it it could be due to past injury. So if I get fatigued, it's my groin squeeze. It's where it shows up, but shoulder rotation doesn't make any difference. 
for example. But I think it's a slippery slope if the metric starts to do the thinking for you, that's sure. the problem. Sure. So it's it's a subtle it's a subtle shift from using metrics to inform your thinking versus using metrics to do your thinking. Yeah. And the truth is there is no metric that gives you an accurate view across the board. And even, you know, when you get into <clears throat> and I've tried them all, you know, heart rate variability. Uh, simple reflex speed, bucket loads, every jump metric you can think of. Um, and I, I'll use them, but yeah, they inform thinking. They don't do the thinking. Right. So, so what I'm hearing from you is, is if you were using one of those tools that you just mentioned and say you have some historical data off of an athlete and their number is – lower than what it normally is there's a deviation you wouldn't automatically cut bait and say okay you're doing an easy session or recovery session you would actually the next step would be let's have a conversation what's going on today you would you know talk to them and have a dialogue and see if this is something that you know do we need to make an adjustment for the day is that is that accurate uh yes it is but it there's a couple of really there's a couple of, I guess you could call it unscientific judgment calls in there. Sure. So first of all, would I have a conversation? That's a judgment call, and it might it would depend on the context. There wouldn't okay. be I would always have a conversation. Okay. It might be. Uh, do I want to bring it up about you know his whatever reach to the wall was a couple of centimeters down? Do I want to, because this person is high, kind of highly anxious athlete, do I want to put a doubt in their head? No, I don't. So maybe I need to tackle that at some other stage. Or it may be, huh, I know this player is a little, a little delicate, you know, talented, but frequently injured. Do I need to pull them from the, from the session or do I need to adapt the session now? Uh, so I think there's there's a, there's choices open to you. Have the conversation with the athlete, and then make a joint decision. You decide whether you have the conversation or decide not to have a conversation and make the decision for the athlete. You know, there's 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 no simple answer. Um, I think I think as well. The other thing is just being aware of the risk profile of this. Let's say hypothetical situation uh you see my scores and there's a couple of my scores in my daily monitoring that are out of whack a little bit um and you're wondering do i say it to him do i reduce his training load and make it obligatory you know so you take the decision or do i not say anything and, and let them have a full training session and they're tight decisions uh, especially if you're close to competition time. And I think what a, a useful thing that I always bear in mind is the risk is asymmetric. In other words, if you get the decision right, if you decide let the athlete train fully, what? okay, so you've taken a risk and you get a benefit. But what's the benefit? Well, they've added one more full session onto the 10,000 full sessions they've already done. What's the fitness benefit? Minimal. One session is never going to do that much. What was the risk you took? Well, you know, I could cut their training by 25%, let's say, that day, or cut their high-speed meters by 50% that day. What's the benefit? Okay, I've substantially in reduced injury risk. What's the cost? From a training adaptation perspective, virtually nothing. Now, what you don't want to do is injure an athlete because if you injure them, then they don't train at all for a number of weeks. So there's an asymmetry there that needs to be weighed off and there needs to be a safety factor built in. There needs to be some kind of decision-making buffer there because we're not talking about, and even if we had, you know, if, if NASA were doing the measurements for us, we wouldn't have empirical precision. So we need to make judgment calls. But for me, it's nearly always on the safe side, yeah. not the soft side, but the safe side. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. For, first, do no harm. Well, yeah, absolutely. And again, if you get it wrong, they're out of training for a long time versus, oh, well, you know, the drama of pulling them out of the last 15 minutes of an hour long session. You know, the cost is nothing. The risk reduction is substantial. So we just, you know, we need to think a little bit more like that, whereas we're inclined to think of it as a 50-50 decision, if, if you know what I mean. I do. I do. John, that, that was fantastic. Um, do you, yeah, you have a final thought there. Well, there's one other thing to add in there. Uh, you, you mentioned testing. Uh, and I think coaches, S&C, sports scientists like testing because it kind of gives them a sense of I'm doing something with my job. I am making progress with my job. You know, the 1RM squat went up or this happened or that happened. And that, you know, I don't have any problem with that. I think what we're there to do is make people better at their event and make them more robust. They're, for me, they're the two goals. We don't really have good tests that reflect that. So I don't think we should use those measures as uh, how well we did. But then the other measures, how much did the athlete improve are very abstract. So it can be very unsatisfying. But you do see a lot of the time you're doing tests and it's more for the coach's psychology than the athlete's uh, performance. Now, there is another thing to say on that, and that is especially with younger athletes, they're very imp- younger, less experienced athletes are more impressionable. And I think that the confidence benefit they get from seeing test results go up is not to be sniffed at and is hugely important. It is like uh, on the job placebo benefit, where placebo benefit is a real and valuable thing. And it's something that as coaches, we trade in all the time unknowingly, or at least, you know, we should. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think uh, I struggle some time with, from a scientific perspective, the work of testing. But I'm a total advocate from the, uh, in the, the, the confidence enhancing side of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's a, that's a very important point you made about, especially with younger athletes, seeing that number one, that's going to give them confidence in themselves Two, they're, they're seeing progress. And then three, you're getting even more buy-in that, Hey, this is working. I'm, I'm making improvements. I'm getting better. Um, you know, that, that, that just, it, it can really have a very positive cascade effect across the board. Well, and it it absolutely does. And I would actually think that, you know, I've seen coaches who were with the best will in the world, technically not great, but yet coached Olympic champions. But what they were always great at was relationships and dialogue and communication. Now, I've seen it the other way. Coaches who were very, very academic, but very poor communicators. And I haven't seen them knocking out Olympic champions or, you know, whatever. So I think that that belief, that uh, sense of that perception that your coach has your best uh, interests at heart and shares your objectives. I don't think you can put numbers on that, um, you know, but we pay little attention to it. We spend more attention focusing sometimes on the 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 nitty gritty and obviously I make my livelihood focusing on the nitty gritty. So I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying, I think we need attention to both things. 100%. Absolutely. Uh, John, that was, that was great. Do you have anything that else that you want to add uh, just to wrap up and put a button in this one? Um, Yeah, I I guess we haven't talked much about, physical training in terms of periodization. It was more the things that periodization doesn't encompass. I I think that there's one interest or one um, topic I've been really interested in for a number of years that kind of captures this within kind of a single 
rubric or umbrella term. And that's the concept of mindset. Now, obviously, mindset is a, a word we use every day in lots of different contexts. But if you think of mindset as the conceptual lens through which you view and understand a specific concept. So let's say I have a mindset around endurance training or I have a mindset around what a training session should look like or how I should approach a training session. And that mindset can be can be positive or negative. It could be, oh no, you know, I hate that training session or oh, I hate those long runs, they're really boring or I hate those short intervals, they're really hard. And day of outcomes, if I go into a training session dreading it, anxious, anticipating suffering, that is not a good, I, I am not setting a good neurochemical, biochemical backdrop. I am not going to get optimal adaptations. So, and the thing about mindsets are they're pretty easily changed. They can be changed by a coach who's trusted, who has gained the athlete's trust, having a conversation with the athlete and saying, these sessions aren't about hurt. These sessions about move, are about moving you closer to your goals, for example. You're not changing the session. You're just very slightly altering how the athlete looks at the session. And that is powerful. Now, just to give you an illustration, I, I don't expect anyone to take my word for it, but uh, maybe 2017, uh, uh, I forget, it was some type of investment company, maybe 300 workers, divide them up into two groups, give them two five-minute educational sessions. One is about stress is debilitating, and it gives you absolute exact spot-on science about the negative effects of stress. Five-minute presentation, ten, ten, maybe it was 10 minutes, can't remember. The other uh, 150 or so, stress is enhancing. Again, gives you factual, scientifically valid information. Stress releases cortisol or causes cortisol to be released. Cortisol sharpens perception, sharpens your eyesight, sharpens this, sharpens that. Whereas in the other one, stress is debilitating, was cortisol has uh, uh, long-term negative effects if it's excessive, if release is excessive. Truthful information. There's no deception here. It's just how the information is framed. Give all those 300 people a public speaking task. Cortisol profiles are different in both. Not only that, so they're more favorable in the people who were given the stresses enhancing mindset. Not only that, with those people were more in light, were more likely to engage in um, uh, critical feedback that they were given afterwards. The critical feedback that are that makes you that is essential to learn and move forward. So that's a really simple example of how you can and the coach does knowingly or unknowingly tinker with someone's neurochemistry all the time. There hasn't been much science done in it, but little bits that have been done in sport, coaches' facial expressions change concentrations of neurochemicals in the brain. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. I've certainly seen it going into big events and the coach is nervous and all of a sudden anxiety just sweeps through the squad. Or the coach is really calm, rock solid, consistent. Regardless of what they're feeling inside, that's how they present and that's how the squad are. These things are important. Then again, they're not important from a fluffy perspective. They're important from a physical, mechanical adaptation perspective. And we keep thinking about training as a physical thing. It's not. It's a neurobiological thing. It's brain and body together. You're separating them. If you, the more you separate them, the more you get it wrong. Thank you for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. If this content is important to you, please be sure to rate and review so more people can listen. Also, you may follow me on social media, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook to get weekly free content. For more in-depth content, please subscribe to my email newsletter at my website, leotraining.io. Be sure to check out the resources page to download free, helpful content. 
If you have any questions or feedback, please contact me directly by email at joe at leotraining.io or via Instagram. The handle is at leotraining. Thank you again for listening and have a great day.